Welcome back to the LifeForge podcast. This is Adbukta. This is Murps. Let's talk expansion. It's here. Well, uh, the announcement of the expansion is here. The expansion itself, uh, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer on that. But we have news. Uh, and we at least know what the name is, and we have some cards. The next expansion is Voyage to the Sunken City, and it launches April 12th. So we do have some weeks ahead. Mm -hmm. you know, we, it's a little have, later than usual. Yeah, we got almost a month until you are able to play the new expansion. But we've seen a lot of cards already. We've seen the mechanics. We can talk about that. Yeah, we can talk about that. And they have said that they will announce the core changes soon, but they haven't announced uh, those yet. And core is going to change, um, and that's going to have a huge impact. And of course, they're also going to do a new rotation of some sort, and that will have a even bigger impact on what the meta is going to be. So as is the case with this, this is going to be a huge change to the entirety of the arena. It's always the case with the first expansion of every year. Yep. So remember... Right now, we are only talking about the expansion, uh, the core set changes, whatever they may be. And this is the first time that we're going to see the core, some sort of changes to a core set. Uh, so we don't know. We don't have any precedent for this. But whatever they do decide, it's going to be a huge impact, <clears throat> bigger impact than the expansion even. So when we're talking about this, um, you know, we can discuss a little bit. But keep in the back of your head, this isn't everything. Uh, mm -hmm. This isn't even most of it. Most of it is going to be something that the vast majority of Hearthstone players won't care about, really. Uh, but will be really, really important for us, right? It's like, right now, for example, you can think about the implications of Basilisk and um, the uh, that other three drop that gains Divine Shield and Taunt on three. Lone Champion. Uh, Lone champion, and, and you can think about, oh, what does that mean, right? How does that impact the meta, the meta, et cetera, et cetera? These are things that you know we can go in really in depth about. Uh, the fact that there is a yeti, there might not be a yeti in the next expansion, or there might be a yeti plus. We we have no idea. Maybe five fours are going to be the new stat line instead of four fives. So we're not talking about that because we can't talk about that. Uh, and just keep in the back of your head that that is going to be even more important than whatever happens in this expansion. Yeah, so just starting off, um, uh, it, it, what Merce was saying about five, uh, what, five four instead of four five, five fives may be the new neutral four mana card. Maybe. Like looking at some of the cards that's going to be released in Voyage to the Sunken City and looking at the cards that were released previously in the, in the previous expansion uh, in Alteric, the power creep is here, so it would not be too weird if the power creep hit core as well. And in many ways, that would be welcome. Because that will, in the arena at least, because that will create a new line of stability in the arena for, uh, for deck quality at least. So uh, we're, we're in interesting times here. But let's go on to the mechanics. Uh, th there's a lot of things being introduced in this set. And... Of these, there are three major new mechanics, features, whatever, that they highlighted to us. So the theme, first of all, is a voyage to the sunken city. It's going to be underwater. There's going to be a lot of fish and whatever around, and it's all nautical. Um, and I hate it, but uh, that's a whole separate thing. One thing that you'll find deep in the waters are Nagas. They are, we've, we've seen them before from the very beginning, uh, and I'm guessing they're a decent part of whatever Warcraft lore Hearthstone is borrowing from, but Nagas are like mermaidy kind of people, and Nagas are a new tribe in the expansion. And their little thing, uh, like dragons, is you have to hold in hand. Nagas' thing is, if you've cast a spell while holding this, do X. So these cards... Uh, rather than having to have a dragon in your hand for this card to have an effect, you would have had to play a spell while you had the, the card that uh, gets buffed up in your hand. So it's like spell burst, but not on the board in your hand. So it's a easier to trigger spell burst, and it only happens once. Yeah, it's interesting um, because w we can talk about this by... Uh kind of bringing up some of the, the neutral ones. Yeah. And, and I think they'll be interesting to talk about. 
Um, because whenever I was talking about Nagas uh, with some people in the Green Goat Discord, uh, one thing that was brought up, it's like, oh, it's just like spell burst. Well, mm. it's not exactly like spell burst. There's extra uh, considerations here. I mean, for example, with spell burst, what you can do is you can drop spell burst and then you can play spells afterwards. Sometimes on the same turn, a lot of times you can put it off. Um, I think a lot of people aren't really appreciating the fact that you have to play a spell before you play this thing. And for a lot of the way that spells are trending right now, um, there's lots of, you know, like, you're focused on a lot of big spells. And for you to use some of these spells, especially, for example, do you want to pull up the uh, neutral Naga, the, the four mana four four? Yeah. yeah so, uh, well, I can't pull it up because I don't have that set up. But uh, oh, okay, we don't the, have that. The set four up. mana common, talk. yeah. Your baseline Naga for neutral is a four mana four four Naga common called Baba Naga, uh, and it says battle cry. If you've cast a spell while holding this, deal three damage. Let's talk about this because this was revealed last night uh, during the big, I think it was like 15 card reveal by Redbeard and Judge, and they did a great job. And also, uh, props to Blizzard for doing something like mm -hmm. this. Uh, this is something that um, happened last expansion as well. And I think we've been saying for years, this is just such a great idea. Why not? give these cards to the arena community in which you give us a three mana three four with a tag or like battle cry deal one damage if you just went oh and three or something like that would be like, ooh, let's discuss uh and no constructed player would care about that it's just a really really good way uh to create excitement for the group that actually would be excited about it give opportunity to Redbeard and Judge, and uh, it's great. So good job to Redbeard and Judge. Uh, thank you once again to Blizzard. I know Alkali has been making a huge, huge push to do something like this, so props to her. Uh, hope we see more of this in the future, and I think that Redbeard and Judge just absolutely crushed it. Okay, right. so let's, Naga. let's talk about this card. Right, um, when this was discussed yesterday as well, you, uh, the, the card that a lot of people brought up was like, oh, Fireplume Phoenix, right? And for those of you who forget, Fireplume Phoenix is a 4-mana 3-3 three, three, battle cry deal 2 damage. So this card, Baba Naga, gains plus 1, plus 1, and you also deal 1 more damage, but you have to cast a spell before then. Mm -hmm. We have to remember something. If you want to play this on curve, which is an if, right? You don't have to. You have to play a spell, either on turn 1, 2, or mm -hmm. 3. Now... It's very easy when you have the coin, right? So I like the fact that it's like, oh, there's extra consideration for having the coin. People always complain. It's like, oh, I go second. I lose all the time. And now it's like, oh, the coin ex has extra value. It's a neat way to do that. But oh, man, that really changes like how good this Baba Naga is in the early game. And also, if you uh, don't have the coin, when are you playing a spell? You know, like when exactly Especially because playing? the uh, offering rates for spells are, I mean, they're actually better now than they were like four months ago, but they're still kind of low. You're still not like back in the day, you would expect to have 10 spells or weapons in your deck. Nowadays, I don't know what they did with the offering rate or whatever, but you're expecting to have maybe like six spells in your deck. And then you're, you're kind of happy with that. You oftentimes have lower than that. Depends on the class, of course, but on average, it's not that good. Um, but when you do have a spell that you play, which usually means it's not you, you've lost a curve turn, or you have the coin, what happens here with this uh, with this Baba Naga card is it does something that drag uh, that uh, spell burst generally cannot do, which is that it is a tempo card because yeah. spell burst requires you to put it out and then play a spell to get the effect. It's almost always anti tempo, whereas here. You may not be able to just put it out, but if you do happen to play a spell, also known as the coin, before you need to play this card or card similar to it, you can get a tempo effect. So in many ways, this card is more like Scale Rider, which is the 3 mana 3-3 three, three that deals 2 damage if you have a dragon in your hand. So this is a 4 mana 4-4 four, four and deals 3 damage if you've already played a spell. Uh, both of these are bad drops unless you fulfill a condition and then they become really good tempo cards and you guys know 
uh, how good uh, Scale Rider is in this current meta. But we have a lot of dragons in this meta, and you don't have to play a dragon beforehand. Uh, but this, you would all, you would coin before this anyway. So half the time, it's a Scale Rider that's already triggered, but even better. So uh, this wasn't really mentioned last night, and, and, and for good good reason. Like, it, it's a reveal stream. Mm -hmm. no, number one, you want to keep it positive. You want to keep it fast moving. Uh, otherwise, uh, it would take forever. Imagine us reviewing <laughs> first of all imagine us reviewing cards ever but uh, imagine us reviewing 15 cards we will be here all night we um, would probably take the same amount of time that they reveal 15 cards with three cards yes probably and that's us hurry so one thing that i want to be cautious about and we always want to think about because a lot of people look at something like spellburst and they're like oh you know what spellburst was fun in its way and it was okay it was fine right it didn't like ruin arena um when i look at something like the these naga designs and i we can talk about other naga cards as well but like they're very very sort of like feast or famine as mm -hmm. in you activate it it's amazing you don't activate it let's just take this a four mana four four in today's meta sucks like it's it's not acceptable it just really really sucks so and, and keep um, in mind a four mana four four sucks even more in a normal today's meta it, in tomorrow's yeah. meta it sucks even more because this current meta actually has a lot of old sets in that it's dragging the average power level down which is one of its problems in whatever the next rotation is chances are you're going to have just more better cards so spellburst was in skullamance academy so which means whenever spellburst is in skullamance academy is in you guys might not think about this a lot, but what Skolamance Academy did was recognize that Spellburst was a thing, and therefore they gave a lot of support for spells. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, so Studies. you had, yeah, you had stuff like Onyx Mage Scribe. You had class, um, uh, you, you had class spells that like gave uh, that were small spells, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, of the studies. Uh, you had the wand thieves. You, um, mm. you, you had all those things that really helped the class get spells so that they can spell burst. And a lot of them were small, right? It's like yep. small cars that got you spells, small spells that got you more spells, all of that stuff. And this is why whenever you think about spell burst, you're just like, oh yeah, that was fine. Mm -hmm. And you always have, not always, but like, yeah, that, that meta, whenever Spellburst was in, was always plentiful and filled with spells. That's because Skolamance thought about that, and they put that in. Now, we haven't seen a lot of the cards in uh, the Sunken City yet, but uh, with, with an entire feature, Nagas, that rely on you playing a spell from your hand while the naga is in your hand to activate this huge effect just mm -hmm. you know similar to spellburst i don't see the support there yet yeah um and without that support so what happens after that you know we, we have to go down this path right if you don't have that what happens historically the best classes in a meta tend to have the most spells um they have a lot of class cards and you can certainly point me to like uh, you can certainly point me to metas that are very different, right? But historically, the best classes also have, like, the most class cards. And class cards include spells. They have the most spells. Um, I, I'm definitely a bit worried about this Naga mechanic. Uh, and because there are many differences between the Naga mechanic, uh, the lack of this sort of, like, Equ equity and equality in distributing spells along all of the classes that I saw with Skullamance. And then if you look at just historically what happens in the arena uh, with good classes and class cards and spells, I'm just like, oh man, this could turn out to be problematic. Um, so this is something that I immediately saw yesterday during the stream. And I'm just like... Oh, I think a lot of people are looking at Spellburst and being like, Spellburst was okay, um, and therefore, I think this is going to be okay as well. And I'm just like, ah, uh, it, it just, it's it's not exactly the same. Now, look, I'm not saying it is going to be bad. Uh, we haven't seen the vast majority of the cards from the expansion yet, so they could add in that support. 
they could have like some weird like i don't know they could put in neutral spells i have no idea right uh it could actually be time for neutral spells now um but i think too many people aren't sort of looking at it and and just being like this could be problematic i think too many many people are equating it with just spell burst and being like oh spell burst worked it's... out as in it, it could be toxic but I'm I'm definitely a little bit worried. Oh, yeah, I'm not even looking at it from the spellburst perspective because I think it has much more similarity with dragons than it does with spellburst. It's a buff that happens in your hand. It's a hand buff. Spellburst is not a hand buff. Spellburst is a normal synergy. Instead of reading spellburst, it could read if you play a beast, do X. It is just a super normal synergy that they wrapped up in a neat little bow and gave it a name. That's all. But this is not a normal synergy. This is a hand synergy. It is a hand buff synergy. It's not the same exact same as dragons, but it has, and, which gives it in some ways more flexibility and in other ways less flexibility. But that's the effect. The effect is tempo or the potential effect is tempo, right? It, it, it's not always going to be tempo. For example, no. um, another uh, uh, neutral card that was revealed that is a Naga and has this effect is a three mana three four, which is you know vaguely on curve these days. Uh, Crush Claw Enforcer, Battle Cry, if you cast a spell while holding this, draw a Naga. Uh, so that is card advantage. But it does give the designers flexibility to make this uh, a, uh, a, a tempo play. And we know what happens with dragons. We know what happens with dragons when dragons get support. It's, it's always terrible. And that's not just because there are Yaseras around and there are Twin Tyrants around. Like, that's certainly a big part of why it's terrible. But even without those cards, a lot of dragons have always been a messy meta because you're getting these super-tempoed uh, kind of plays that shouldn't be allowed. And back in the day, it was a problem because you didn't have super-tempo plays. But nowadays, these super-tempo plays are super, super, super-tempoed. Here is your Knight Captain equivalent, right, in, in neutral. And it's a 4-mana four 4-4 four, four that deals 3 damage. Knight Captain is a 5-mana 3-3 three, three that deals 3 damage. Um, it becomes a 6-6, six, six, but again, we keep harping on this. It doesn't do it that often. But this card, if you actually are able to play spells at any reasonable clip, or if you have the coin, this card is as good, if not better, than a Knight Captain. Now, that's a big if, right? You have to be in a class that has a lot of spells, or you have to go second. So, in reality, I think we're in for a world of hurt if this card's actually better than Night Captain. We are not going to rate this card better than Night Captain. I'm almost certain. Haven't done the math. But, yeah, there's, but there's, there's almost no chance, right? Um, but that's because it's not, you're not going to have a coin all the time. That's because you're probably not going to have the spells. But when you do, it swings the game because it swings on turn 4 rather than turn 5. It can swing the game as hard as Night Captain, and it does it in a wildly unpredictable fashion that's literally determined by whether you go first or second, which is outside of everyone's control. So, yes, it's always good to make the coin better because going second sucks. And so, uh, you know, it's not, it, it would have been worse if this was better for going first than for going second. But having this dramatically different effect on power level uh, is, 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 pretty bad for a meta it makes it more volatile it makes it more unpredictable it makes your whether you win with a deck it makes whether your deck is good or bad vary a lot on coin flips that happen before the match starts like none of this is skill right like all this is pure circumstance and when, when we get into this trouble which and a part of this problem is what we keep harping on for this prior meta and why it's so bad is that a lot of times you'll have a deck that you think is oh this is a good deck well it's only a good deck if you draw cards a b and c and don't draw card z if you draw card z without drawing cards a b and c this is a terrible deck even though when you just look at it this is a good deck because the difference between z and a b and c have gotten so wide well, here, you're adding an additional layer on it, right? Like, even if you see the deck, even if you know you're going to draw the card in the deck, it still now depends on whether you go first or second. Like, you're, 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 having, you're adding more volatility to whether a deck that you know 100% information on is even good or not. And it is determined not even by matchup, right? That's another determinant of how good your deck is, is what it's matching up against. This is just another RNG layer on top of it. 
Yeah, so when Adulta is talking about this is similar to dragons, it's just the hand aspect of it. Dragons are definitely easier to proc because you just have to have a dragon in mm. your hand. Well, um, I don't know about that. Um, here, half the time, you, you get a dragon in your hand immediately on half your games from the start of the game. Well, yeah, I mean, that requires you to get a dragon. But, like, it doesn't require you to sort of, like, do anything with the dragon beforehand, right? right? Here, right. you have to play the spell. Well, it and requires it, you not to have played the dragon, right? But that only applies in very limited circumstances when it comes to a four drop. Exactly, yeah. Um, and here, it's like, if you play your spell... Because you have to play the spell to trigger your... Like, let's say you have card A that, that is a Naga, and you have card B that is mm -hmm. upcoming, right? You have to play the spell to trigger A. Meanwhile, with the dragons, you could just play A by having a Right, but you're dragon, guaranteed right? to have and a coin have in your hand half the time. You are not with a dragon. Right, sure. But then, of course, once you use that coin, which you are going to early, like, all the rest of yes. your kind of things later on, like, you know, so... Um, yeah, th there's, there's a lot of this, like, oh, how are you going to wait uh, to trigger the thing? Meanwhile, if you guys have played this meta as well, like, sometimes you just have a shitty dragon in your hand, and I'm going to tell you guys, that, that dragon just stays in my hand, like, not mm -hmm. forever, but maybe, like, six turns, and that, that's just what I always use to proc my Anixian Warders, to proc my Historians, to proc all the stuff. Like, it's just creating huge value in my hand, and it's probably, like, the four-mana 3-5 dragon, right? Like, I just drafted that, and it just stays in my hand, and I don't have to play it, but it's providing huge value because it's activating my Historians and Anixian Warders. And that's like, oh, cool, three, five, you know, four drop. You're you're doing an insane amount of work right now. You don't even know. You're just chilling in my hand. Um, and it's certainly different with uh, with the Nagas. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I I don't love this mechanic for Arena, and I can see it being problematic in some ways. I hope it doesn't. Uh, I'm I'm obviously going to hope that it it, it doesn't cause too many problems. But uh, I. Like, I, I, with the way that it's going, I, I'm very hesitant. I, I don't think I'm very hesitant. I'm more just like pointing out the volatility part of it. Just on the power level, even just looking at this, right? Like, we survived Night Captain, and we don't think Night Captain's too powerful. Uh, Baba Naga's not as powerful as Night Captain, and the swings that it provides in a modern, in like this new power creep uh, arena, is really not going to be so bad. Like, it's going to be bad, right? But it's more just a contributing factor than any kind of game changer. So I'm not really like worried for it in the arena, but it is certainly not like a great mechanic to have in the arena. Like spell burst didn't totally break arena, right? Like dragons, if you take out the actual individually good dragons, just talking about dragon synergy, did not totally break arena. Uh, both of them, I would argue, were not good for arena. Those were not arena friendly mechanics. Those like put a weird thumb on the scale for weird things in arena and made it terrible in different ways. Um, but like, but, but they weren't like, they were not the big problem. Like, if Arena had problems during the eras in which these mechanics were dominant in the Arena, these mechanics themselves were not the biggest reasons. It was something else. So I'm not, like, that worried. But it's not, like, a positive in Arena. Like, these types of mechanics are almost always, like, a negative in Arena uh, for, for for good players, for players who care about skill, right? Um, okay. Uh, you have anything more to say about Nagas and this kind of, uh, this Naga mechanic? Nope. Okay. Let's talk about the next mechanic. The next mechanic is uh, the most amazing mechanic to ever come to the arena. And I say this because I think everybody who has ever played MTG or a bunch of any other card games that have the same exact mechanic have wanted it in Hearthstone. It's so simple. It's so elegant. It's in every other card game. It's not complicated. Why is it not in Hearthstone? Um, well, it's in Hearthstone now. Super low-hanging fruit, um, and they finally bit at it. It is Dredge. Uh, Dredge is Scry from Magic the Gathering. Uh, it is a Sightless Watcher uh, from, well, Hearthstone. But it is not a class-specific skill, it is a general skill. So a card, for example, would be a 2-mana two 2-3 two, Pirate, Tuscar, Trawler, Battlecry, Dredge. Or 4-mana 3-6, Excavation Specialist, also a neutral common, uh, battle cry dredge reduce its cost by one so dredge is not exactly worth 
it's not just the bonus that's attached to a card. Sometimes it can add a secondary minor bonus to the card. Um, so they're they're valuing Dredge at not doing that much, right? And that's fair because the mechanic is not like super, super game-changingly powerful. But if you don't know what Scry is, uh, what Dredge does, or and what Sightless Watcher is, what Dredge does is it shows you three cards and then you pick a card and that goes on the top of your deck. More specifically yep. for Dredge, it shows you yep. the bottom three cards of your deck. This will matter because there's going to be certain synergies put into this set where you are putting stuff in the bottom of your deck, you're adding random cards to the bottom of your deck, your opponent is putting stuff in the bottom of your deck, and then you can dredge it up, right? But for an arena perspective, 99% of the time it won't matter where it's coming from. You are just taking cards from your deck and you are moving one of them to the very top. Um, and the other two go to the bottom, right? Or they stay at the bottom in this case. So, yeah. Uh, it's an interesting mechanic flavor-wise and <clears throat> something that people have been expecting to see for a while now. It's cool. Uh, it, it introduces uh, that little bit of consistency. Um, it also introduces kind of like a, a, a skill testing factor into mm -hmm. it without like a huge swing. Uh, and it's, it's definitely not, not a random. huge immediate swing. And it's not random. Yeah. So I like it. You know, it, it, it'll present you with those opportunities in which do you take the thing that fits your curve for the next turn or two a little bit better? Do you pick that big greedy card? Um, and then, of course, the consideration is like, well, even if I don't pick the greedy card, I should have other chances to dredge, right? Mm -hmm. Question mark. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Will you get to dredge again in the next few turns and then um, be able to play the big card? Do you kind of have to take it now? Will you survive? Oh, that's fair. That's fair. I didn't even think about it in that sense. But yeah, uh, a dredge, uh, if you dredge multiple times, it is very different than scry because you are not like drawing your next uh, your your you know those cards are still at the bottom of your deck. So you're going to dredge the same uh, two of the same three cards. So this is... Uh, I, I like this a lot. I mean, flavor-wise, it's also fantastic. Um, I've talked about Skull and Man's Academy uh, being great flavor-wise. Uh, and I think that this set so far... Um, I'm not going to say it's going to match Skull and Man's Academy for me, but I, I do like the fact that whenever you have a keyword that really fits into the theme of the expansion, because let's face it, Hearthstone is a pretty fun, wacky, just out there kind of thing with lots of inside jokes, uh, and that adds to the appeal of it. So I, I, I like how they, I guess, finally found uh, a way to make Scry flavorfully appear in... Um, in an expansion, although I'm sure there were opportunities before, but th this is just long overdue. Mm -hmm. And this is a mechanic that uh, I don't know if it's going to become evergreen, but as a good, good chance of becoming evergreen, um, like like tradable kind of is already. Um, it's one of those like TCG staples, uh, and why it's so beloved by the community uh, in general is it's a way to reduce randomness. So the best part about Discover isn't that you get a random card, it's that you get to make a choice. And the worst part about Discover is that those are random choices. So you're increasing randomness, you're making it harder to balance, blah, 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 blah. Here, you're just looking at your own cards. So there is a reduction of the element of drawing luck, of RNG and draw. You've reduced it. So for the three cards, you're knowing one that you're going to draw next that significantly reduces the randomness and you haven't added any additional RNG into the game to counteract that. So this is just a, it is one of those mechanics that is a godsend for skillful players. Like this is going to increase significantly your win rate uh, if you are a skilled player versus if you are a lesser skilled player, you know, after you get used to the mechanic and the meta and all that. Uh, assuming dredge cards are even okay in the arena, and we know that they're okay in the arena because we see these neutral cards. Tuscar Trawler, it's a croc with an additional dredge ability. It's like Sightless Watcher. Those are totally fine cards to pick in the arena. You're not going to want to take them over the actual busted cards that you're going to see quite frequently nowadays, but they're, they'll, they'll be in there. They'll, you'll, you'll have them in your deck. And Excavation Specialist is a totally on-curve four drop that not only dredges, but also reduces the cost of the dredged up card by one. 
So, and remember, you can select a dredged up card. So you can select a six drop that you can play on turn five, right? You can even improve your curve with this. Um, now you have to magically in your bottom three cards get a six drop of which you probably have one or two of in your whole deck. But, you know, it could happen. Um, and these are, so it makes it uh, an even better card. And so these, these cards have places. We already know that they're neutral and they're everywhere. And so they have places in your deck. They're not the most amazing cards in this game. They will not be your first picks, but you'll see them a couple times if you're just drafting normally. And that increases the overall skill in the game the same way tradable does. All right, so I already see people uh, asking about this and it's a very fair question. It's like, oh, uh, how does dredge work with shuffling? Um, because this is something that, uh, I brought up the example, right? It's like, oh, I dredge and I take the uh, on-curve tempo 5-drop instead of the, let's say, Rune of the Archmage, right? Mm -hmm. um, and can I get Rune of the Archmage again if I dredge and nothing weird has happened as a no-shuffling effects, uh, like on turn 7? And the answer is, as of right now, from the community, what, what we understand, and unless something changes, and I hate that I have to say all yeah, this of this. This is a textual, literal interpretation. Yes. Um, that Rune of the Archmage will still be there mm -hmm. after the first dredge. You have not changed the order. Bringing a card to the top or inserting a card to the bottom does not shuffle it. If the card says shuffle, mm -hmm. then you do shuffle. Everything is topsy-turvy. and everything gets messed up um but if you're placing things in a certain order and then you are doing other stuff that's fine so for example um if you're dredging if you're playing like a lore keeper pole kelt right remember that it orders your deck in a very specific mm -hmm. way uh from biggest to smallest and then you can so it does that you can dredge and then you can bring stuff up you can put stuff on the bottom but if a card shuffles then all of that order is shuffled mm -hmm. so uh there are certain cars that shuffle mm -hmm. and that messes up all the orders but from our current understanding uh dredge doesn't mess up whatever order it was there before so if there is a rune of the archmage at in the bottom three of your deck you bring up another card and um Assuming that nothing else like happens, if you dredge again, that rune of the Archmage should still be there. Yep, um, and that's why I said it's. Uh, I didn't real. I didn't even think about this um, before uh, you made that comment uh, about double dredging. Uh, so I thought it was like basically the same as scry, but that is like functionally different than scry, even without the synergies that put stuff on the bottom of your deck or whatever. Because you can very easily play two dredge cards over the course of the game, and the bottom of your deck is probably not going to change. So the second time you play dredge, you're going to see two of the cards that you rejected and one more card. So you will know a lot of information already, right? You will know the two cards at the bottom of your deck already after you dredge first. You know a lot of information, and it's even... I mean, the, the chances of this in Arena uh, being relevant is so astronomically small but you also know that yeah well unless there's cars that burn cars from the bottom of your deck which there may be right like uh the, the, there could be like a ocean floor scraper kind of <laughs> neck thing i i don't know right like it could definitely be a thing um but right now for example we have a lot of cars that uh either steal or burn or swap or do something to the very top of your deck um, and you know, for example, if you have a rune on the bottom and you definitely don't want that burned or stolen or whatever, um, it's, quote, safe, at least for now, uh, at the bottom of your deck, barring cars that come out that specifically target that thing. Extra considerations here and there. Uh, but yeah, it's what makes Dredge a very interesting thing flavor-wise. Um, it gives it a little bit of extra spice and a little bit of extra kick on top of the scry that we know from MTG. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so those are the two mechanics, uh, the Naga mechanic and the Dredge mechanic that you'll see everywhere because they are on neutral commons. 
um, and decent neutral commons to good neutral commons just from what we've seen. And they may be on a broken neutral common. We don't know. We haven't seen it yet, though. Uh, the third mechanic, there's three mechanics in this set. The third mechanic that is being released so far is only on legendaries. So we don't have to be too scared of them, except that it's a ridiculous mechanic and all the cards that we've seen with it, and it's going to create 18 more Yseras in the arena. But uh, why, don't you, why don't you introduce that one? Yeah, okay, we have Colossus. <laughs> Colossal cards. The colossal keyword basically means whenever you play this card that has the colossal keyword, um, it comes with extra bodies or appendages, whatever, that synergize with the main body that you played in various ways. And you just have to talk about some of these because they are very, very, very different. Let's talk about a simple one. And this one was introduced first. Uh, and for good reason, it's kind of easy to understand. Um, we can talk about the Druid one. So uh, this is a Druid legendary 7 mana 6-5 beast with Colossal plus 1. Now, you're going to see Colossal plus 1, Colossal plus 2, whatever. The number after the Colossal just means how many extra bodies are added and the bodies are going to be different. Um, and uh, it says immune while you control Colax uh, Shell. This card's name, name is Colax. Yeah. And it's a beast. Uh, and then Colax Shell uh, is a zero. Uh, it's a five mana, zero, eight beast. But you don't have to pay the mana, keep in mind. Right, you don't have to pay the mana. Um, with Taunt and Death Rattle, gain eight armor. So. You got to get through this giant <laughs> eight health shell uh, that also just like gains them uh, armor, like even if it dies. But if you're not able to kill it, uh, that big six attack body is immune and just gets to attack uh, and, and trade off for free. So really, really powerful, like really, really powerful. And this is one of the ones in which if you look at it, you're just like, OK, this is kind of like. You know, for a legendary for 2022, this is fine. This is fair. You know, but in that sort of this is fine while you're, you know, sitting there in the middle of the fire, kind of like, oh, this is fine kind of things. Like we've seen um, better legendaries. Yeah, but this isn't bad. <laughs> this is this, this is still is quite... like really good. I don't know if it's going to be S tier or, you know, I don't know. I think it's going to be at least S tier. Probably going to be S tier. Uh, but it's not like... S plus plus tier, what's going on? You know, it's not even like S plus tier, probably. I don't know, I haven't done the math. Right. Um, and then you have uh, <laughs> also cards like Gigafin, for example. Uh, Gigafin is a giant murloc for warlocks. Because, uh, I don't know, they've kept on trying to make uh, warlock or murloc warlocks a thing. I have no idea. It's an 8 mana 7 4. Colossal plus one, battle cry, devour all enemy minions. So you just eat all of them, uh, which it's like a twisting nether. You, you eat all of them. Death rattle, spit them back. Yeah, single sided. <laughs> so you can keep the temple on your side and keep going face. Death rattle, spit them back out. Uh, and the colossal uh, aspect, the colossal plus one aspect spawns um, Gigafin's Maul. It's a six mana. 4-7 Taunt, that's also a Murloc. Death Rattle permanently destroy all minions inside Gigafin. So, uh, easy, right? All you gotta do once they Twisting Nether you is to have a spell in hand. Just always have 4 damage on hand. By the way, it can't be a rush. Or like, you need a lot of rush. <laughs> you need a lot of rush because you gotta break through this... Uh, uh, like, oh wait, you can't. You can't. It destroys you can't. all minions. It destroys all oh, okay. your minions. Sorry. Uh, just have um, just have four damage. Just have four damage. You have four damage, right? Or like Who an assassinate, that? or just the, or just use an assassinate on that. This is just like the uh, the Diablo Immortal panel. Where it's like, don't you guys have phones? Like, don't you guys have four damage? Uh, it's okay. You always have four damage, so it's fine. But yes, you can see now that these colossal cards are just super tempo. First of all, like a ridiculous amount of tempo. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you know Arena in 2022 as well, 
yes, you know, you can definitely play mid-range. You can definitely try to get some face damage in. But if people are playing correctly, which, of course, some people aren't. But if you're playing correctly, uh, you can get to the later turns. And, man, the swings just just keep coming. Uh, the And we're... For example, Gigafin is just one of the biggest swings you can ever encounter, period. Um, and even in the worst case scenario, it is an 8 mana, 4 7 taunt that casts a Frost Nova and forces the opponent to use a card and whatever mana it costs to deal at least 4 damage. That's still pretty good. Like, like think about it, like, just even in terms of, like, a Deathwing, right? Which is, like, a 12-12. So a 4-7 and a 7-4 put together is kind of like an 11-11. Um, it only clears one side of the board, not both sides of the board. And you don't have to discard any cards, and it's two mana cheaper. Like, mm -hmm. it's a pretty big power creep on Deathwing, the new Deathwing, that is already one of the best cards in the arena. Um, like, one of the best cards, legendary or non-legendary, in the arena. So it, it's, it's quite insane. Uh, it does have this slight weakness where if you do, or if you are able to remove it, especially if you're able to remove it efficiently by dealing four direct damage, it's not all that big of a monster, but that's going to be tough, especially for some classes. For some classes, you're almost guaranteed to, to not be afraid of it, right? Like they have to be holding the new Naga in their hand and, like, an Elven Archer, and then you're like, oh, maybe you could deal four direct damage. Otherwise, like, they got to do some kind of combo to get the damage on you. Yeah. Uh, so, look, these Colossal Minions are really, really ridiculously strong. And some of them are a little bit more conditional, um, and, and, and that's, that's fine. But, man, uh, I don't love the introduction of these colossal minions on top of all of the dragons that we've gotten, you know, like Raid Boss and Nixia and everything. Uh, it's just sort of like giant, like swings back and forth. Um, do you have more swings than your opponent? It, it, it's hard to predict. You can't really play around this stuff uh, because lots of times people have cars that are capable of four for one, five for one. And it, you can't really play uh, that value game uh, and, and rely upon it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like, th they're all like this, by the way. I see a comment in chat that's like, oh, only the Druid and Warlock ones are great. I'm like, what? They're all, like, pretty amazing. Like, I just take uh, the Warrior one, which doesn't look... It's probably one of the weaker ones, but it's... Uh, it's one of the weaker it's ones. It's one of the weaker definitely. ones. And you can just hear how powerful it is. This is one of the weaker ones. It's uh, seven mana... 5-5, five, five, Colossal, uh, Battlecry, discover three pirates to crew Nelly's ship. Uh, so you, get, you have three, three pirates. Um, and then the, the Colossal thing that it summons is a 2-6 taunt, which is, I guess these days it would be the equivalent of like a 3.5 drop by itself. Um, with a death rattle, add Nelly's pirate crew to your hand. They cost one mana. So... You have a effectively on curve minion that has a taunt, and then you're gonna get a big tempo boost as well as a bunch of extra tempo whenever your pirate ship dies. Right. Like, look, is this like a, a S plus tier card that's gonna totally win you the game? Probably not. But this is not a like average legendary. This is a significantly above average. This is a good legendary card, even by today's standards. Yeah, even by today's standards, it's a, it's a really good legendary. Uh, it just goes to show the power. I mean, like, you know, if we're comparing this with, like, the Gigafin, yeah, right? It's right. like, yeah, g give me the Gigafin. <laughs> now, of course, is Nelly the Great Thresher good? Yeah, it's great. And uh, we we also just might see brokenly good pirates oh, for yeah. a warrior. We don't know yet. It, it, we don't know yet. Uh, I do know there's some pretty bad pirates, and on average... Uh, pirates aren't great um th they also introduce like a couple of like amalgam kind of things that like aren't like they're mm -hmm. small right so yeah like um with the uh with nelly uh you also don't get like a huge amount of burst tempo on the turn that you play yeah. you get it on the next turn yeah uh and in the late game i don't you know there, a lot of crazy things can happen so yeah that it's still great it's still 
really, really uh, game-winningly good uh, a decent amount of times. But we're just kind of used to seeing Raid Boss and Nixia. You're just used to seeing, um, you know, now something like Gigafin. I'm just like, oh, Nelly, you're, you're just really, really good. And in 2022, I don't know if that swings it as a big bomb legendary card. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the Colossal mechanic, which I, I'm, I'm kind of upset that they're so good. I understand why they're so good, because they're legendary, you want them to be constructed viable, and this is what you have to do for things to be constructed viable. But in the arena, Colossus could be so interesting as a keyword. You just can't make the cards that good. Like, if Colossal was not a legendary-only keyword, and there were, like, neutral commons that were Colossal, you'd have very interesting mechanics that create interesting ways to, like, interact with stuff, right? Because uh, Arena's all on the board for the most part, and here you have connected pieces that are on the board that basically come with pre-built synergies, which is one of those things that Arena is, is generally missing, because you can't synergize as much in Arena. So, uh, it... <laughs> Like, I see how the balance design had to be that way for the legendaries, but I think if you're looking at it from a pure arena or just limited perspective, uh, the colossal keyword is a big miss if, uh, um, missed opportunity if, uh, and I don't think they will, um, like have it in, in the neutral, normal kind of setting with less ridiculous effects. Yep. Um, I, I, I hate the fact that legendaries are a huge part of arena now uh if you guys look at the entire history of arena legendaries really weren't a thing and uh for m the vast majority of the years when we did our tier list and we did our evaluations back when we still did it um we didn't really focus on legendaries and then of course once we got to legendaries people would be like oh we think you scored this wrong we're like i don't really care yeah. we took like 30 seconds on it uh that's not really what it's about uh but legendaries are what hearthstone arena is about nowadays um just the number of ways that you generate it just the sheer power of it, it, it like this is also why like night captain is kind of okay <laughs> because uh What's a night captain to a raid boss Anixia, right? Whatever you gain from that. Or, or even what's a night captain to an easily discovered twin tyrant mm -hmm. and then into a, a, a discovered Ysera, into um, an Alexstrasza, uh, raid boss Anixia, all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, that that's sort of where we're at here and uh, man I, I i don't like that because these legendaries are uh they feel legendary and i understand you have to make it such that these cards are in consideration at least in blizzard's eyes for constructed so they have to be really flavorful extraordinarily good and because i'm i don't see any like synergy or yeah i there probably is synergy here but they're just good on their own and that's a scary thing and that's what's happening to like all legendaries now <laughs> almost 100 percent of legendaries created now are at the very least pretty good in arena if not brokenly good whereas if you looked at expansions many years ago i would say a good like 70 80 percent of those legendaries were just okay to bad and then you, you would just think well there aren't that many ways to discover anyways. And the rest of like the 15, 20% could be good to great. Every once in a while you get like a Godfrey, right? And then you'll be like, oh man, Godfrey is like so good. But I don't think anybody was reading like, oh man, Godfrey is breaking the meta because there was only one Godfrey. A lot of the other legendaries are crap. You couldn't really find a lot of ways to discover it. But now it's completely the opposite. All legendaries are really good, and you have a million ways to get them in, into your hand, even if you didn't draft it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and in case you think this is just going to be a very legendary-focused uh, meta, uh, I want to want to talk about a card. I looked at all the cards. Some of them are really good. Some of them are whatever. But there's definitely a power creep going on, and I think this card just illustrates it pretty well. Um, on the class card side. Uh, and it is... Uh, just, I just want to point it out just because this card is going to be ridiculous no matter what the rest of the cards that are released are. It's Miracle Growth. 
It is a druid card. It is uh, seven mana, and it's a nature card. It says, draw three cards, summon a plant with taunt, and stats equal to your hand size. So, you know, draw three cards used to be five mana. Um, now, now, uh, uh, so for two more mana, you get a eight, eight, nine, nine. Like this card is, is a pro tempo card. If you are not just throwing your cards around, if you are playing cards that generate other cards, a lot of cards now generate other cards uh, into your hand. It's not a weird thing, um, especially if you have some some rams around or whatever. Um, you're just playing an over-tempo card. Sure, it's on turn seven. But you're playing an over-tempo card, and you're getting three more cards added to your hand. It's one of those things where it's... It, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Um, I don't know how the math worked on this one for them. I mean, okay, Blizzard has already said they don't do math. Uh, so I guess in testing, this is what was needed for this card to be remotely playable uh, in, in a Druid deck. But as these things get crazier, it gets crazier in Arena. It's like, how does Spawn of Deathwing even exist? Right? How do you uh, get an over-tempo card that has a deadly shot attached to it, and all you got to do is discard one card? Discarding one card used to be the equivalent of, like, gaining a mana. And here it became the equivalent of, like, gaining four mana. Um, how does that happen? Like, well, in Constructed, it was okay. Oh, and it's a dragon. Uh, so here, like, well, how much mana would this normally be? You gain, like, six more mana than you should be able to gain. Like, I don't know. Um, it's... It's, it's going to be ridiculous, and it's, it's not the only one, it's just the most blatantly ridiculous one um, that, that popped up of the, like, 35 cards that they revealed so far, uh, of which only, like, 20 are, are like, 22 are, like, non-legendaries. Uh, and this one's common, by the way. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is going to be rough, and... If we still have the epic offering rate bug, which once again has been acknowledged just in a short tweet uh, by Blizzard as a bug, as in they're mm -hmm. looking into it. Um, I don't expect any changes before the expansion comes out. We're so we, we're, we probably we're hoping have for changes when the expansion comes out because there may not be changes even when the expansion comes out. Yeah. Um, it's going to be potentially problematic because what happens with Epic cards, uh, and Blizzard has kind of been leaning into this, some of the biggest swing cards are Epic. Um, and you can look at it historically with cards like BGH, right? And now BGH is everywhere because of the Epic bug. Um, but you also look at stuff like Rune of the Archmage, right? Rolling Fireball. Like they like to put these kinds of things at Epic. And, it makes and sense. I imagine it makes sense. And I imagine they'll keep doing that. One card I want to point out as potentially problematic, and we will see what the core set is, what the other cards are, but man, I don't love this, uh, is the Garden's Grace in Paladin. It oh, is yeah. <laughs> 10 mana, holy spell. <laughs> so you're, you know, like first your thing is like, oh, 10 mana. Uh, 10 mana, holy spell, epic. Give a minion plus five, plus five, and divine shield costs one less for each mana you've spent on holy spells this game. Okay, for those of you guys who do math, it's here's funny. what happens. After, first of all, there's tons of holy spells that as Paladin you want to play just from the latest expansions. I, I, you know, like maybe they'll get rid of like Blessing of Kings or something if they keep it in what. There's just so many holy spells that you're going to probably want to cast as Paladin. The rule with this card is such that if you have two of these in your deck, if you have three, like, you know, let's say you use the uh, Vakar to discover, right? You're discovering holy spells. The Vakar can help you discover this. It can also help discover other holy spells to help you with this. After you play the first of this card, the second one is always free. That's just how math works. So let's say you get the first one of these cards down to five mana. On turn five, if you have two of these in your hand, you play two of them. So if you have two bodies on five mana, you are able to, to give 
both of your minions, plus five, plus five, and divine shield, or just one thing, plus ten, plus ten, and divine shield. You waste the divine shield. Boo, freaking who. Um, this can get toxic pretty fast. You know, this is one of those cards in which it's like, things are fine, things are fine, things mm -hmm. are totally not fine. And it, it's one in which, like, man, the epic offering bug really affects this card a ton. Like, if you have this card being passively drafted while at the same time being discovered by uh, the, the car uh, and potentially discovered by other ways, I don't know what expansions are in or, or whatever, um, you're going to pretty soon get to just zero mana plus five plus five divine shield and then still have the rest of your mana to tempo in a tempo oriented class that can be very aggressive. So yeah, yeah it's it's scary, man. And and it's why like people don't like mages right now. It's because they have ways to generate uh rolling fireball and ruin the arc mage and all and you know primordial glyph. And they also get to draft it, right? Because of all of that stuff. So um I don't know how the core set is going to look i don't know how the offering race are going to look or how the expansion is going to work i will say that i hope that the epic offering bug is addressed in some ways because with the way that these epic cards have been created with what i'm seeing right now just from that paladin card um i am definitely worried about what could happen because this is what epic cards do this is what Blizzard has stated they want to do with their epic cards. And that's fine when, or it's more fine when the epic cards have the typical reduced offering rate. But when you have it like this, uh, we've already seen what happens with Mage when they have so many Rune of the Arc Mages and so many of, of Rolling Fireballs. Um, same thing can happen to Paladin with this 10 mana spell that very quickly just gets to zero mana. Yeah. So this is the, the worst part about the Garden's uh, Grace is that it is super inconsistent, right? Um, yeah. The, the whole Naga problem that I was talking about earlier, which is what makes Naga more problematic, even though it's not going to be as good as, let's say, a Knight Captain that is more consistent, um, the problematic part is that you're just adding more RNG on top of RNG. You can get this out on turn five, not a you know terribly low percentage of times, and then like for free basically, uh, or or even just for like five mana or whatever, and kind of run away with with the game, or get it out for zero mana on turn like six or seven or whatever, right? Still enough for you to just run uh, run away with the game if this costs one or zero mana, uh, or it could be like a legit ten mana card that is terrible. Totally, yeah. Uh, it, so... it could be. Yeah, it could be like that, or it could be like a, on turn ten, this costs like seven mana or right, something, right? Because right? you didn't draw a terrible, that, terrible and card. it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, it's a five five and a divine shield. Like it's just it's it's not a good card on on ten. Uh, so depending on what the offering rates are and what's actually what cards are actual holy cards, right, and things that generate holy cards are actually in the game, this card may not even be good. Like this card may not be rated a C even it's probably gonna be rated higher than a c um but it's really hard to tell i mean it's literally impossible to tell right now because we don't know I, I, as of right now we have no idea and we don't know what the core yeah. set is and we don't know what the we rest of this is but it's entirely possible this card is not good um if it if there's no i can't imagine that they would print this card in a set that doesn't have some holy spells so i imagine this card is going to end up even in the arena not being unplayable like, at worst, it's going to be, like, a D plus C kind of, like, tier card around where Yeti is. Uh, and from that point on, depending on how much the offering rates are, what cards are in the meta, it can go up. Uh, it can go up to, you know, as potentially, like, an A tier card or, or, or something. But wherever it is, it's going to be a draftable card. And it's going to be a draftable card that will win you games now and then without your opponent being able to do anything not involving any skill on your part or your opponent's part. And this is not the only card like this, right? There's plenty of cards like this in the game, and you're just adding one more prominent ones to it. Like the card that wins the game by itself on certain conditions outside of everybody's control triggers. That's one more nonsense game, right? So the percentage of games determined by skill just keeps going down and down and down. And this card is just flat-out toxic.
Like, it doesn't have to be an S-tier card to be toxic, right? We, we go over this all the time. It's the, it's the volatility of the card and how much of that volatility is controllable. Right. Okay, so I don't want people to focus on... the Because what Adult has said about it's like, oh, sometimes you'll be able to play on turn... Don't focus on that. Because I see people focusing on that in chat, and that, that shouldn't be what you're focusing on. Um, the toxic aspect of it is just the second one is always free. Unless you did something weird, and yeah, yeah, you can give me examples in which something weird happened, and then uh, the reduction is not like the the true reduction that I'm thinking about. Um, but no, like, does it matter that you can only play it, let's say, on turn seven, and the first one costs like four mana, and the second one is free? No, I don't think it should. I don't think that getting. Uh, a split 10-10 double divine shield for like three or four mana I mean, on turn seven. It's still going to be really hard to get two of these, even with the epic. No, no, no. Like, it how is. many times it's... do you have like two spammies in your yeah. like deck? Much well, less in your hand. Once again, uh, there are like, there is a Vakar, right? <laughs> uh, you, right. you do have ways to, like, we have a card in the latest expansion that discovers holy spells, mm -hmm. and this is, like, a holy spell, right? right? right, right. So it's not outrageous. And, and, and this is why I'm saying, like, if you have the stupid epic offering bug, and you have one already in your deck, there are ways to discover it. Like, that, that's why there are so many of these epic things out there. Like, yeah, like, just think about spammy, first of all, right? And nobody's generating spammies either. People are only drafting those. And then if you have ways to generate it, this is why mages have so many stupid runes and stu uh, so many stupid rolling fireballs. So that's the, uh, that's the thing I hate about it. Like, I, I totally agree. Like, this is not a consistent card. <laughs> if this becomes a consistent card, we are going to have issues. We are, we are going to have some major issues so i i hope and i don't i certainly don't expect this to be a consistent card but the problem is that the swing is so big it is so astronomically big and the second card is just stupid like um if slash when you get the second one a free five five divine shield uh worth of tempo is absolutely backbreaking in many scenarios. Like, and yeah, we can talk about it. it's like, oh, all these legendaries are so good as well, and ever. But just look at the the meta right now. Like, these things still matter. We we don't want to get caught up and be like, oh, Gigafin always happens. <laughs> um, all of these colossal minions always happen. RBO always happens. It happens, but it doesn't always happen. Yep. Um, and you see the current meta, right? We don't know what the rotation is in the next one. It's going to be better than this rotation. It's like when I saw the rotation, right? You guys, you guys heard us. Uh, if you listened to the Lifeforge podcast or even just saw the preview, we knew this was going to be a shit show. And it's going to be one of the worst metas. Um, just nothing Blizzard can do about it. They picked these sets to come in the arena, and that's it. Uh, so the next meta is going to be better uh, outside of class balance because uh, that's a different story. But the overall feel of the meta outside of class balance is going to be better because there will be more consistency. You cannot pick worse sets than what happened in the last sets. I mean, you can, but it would be like it's very low chance that they're going to pick worse sets. Um, but whether the, the sets are good or bad, especially if they're on the bad side, even if they're not as bad as this current one, you're going to have a lot of games still, not as much as in this meta, but still a lot of games that you have the same problem that you have in this meta, where you have a whatever deck and you face a bunch of whatever decks and you end up with like five, six wins, even though your deck totally sucks because you're only facing other decks that sucks or other decks that are good, but only because of one or two really good legendaries like these colossals and they don't draw them right so then the deck that you see that they have is is pretty crappy um and that's going to you know again add to the volatility and so all of this stuff matters because whether they have the uh, colossal or the other ridiculous legendaries or not adding a ridiculous adding a singular ridiculous legendary into your deck just increases the volatility of your deck performance um and and that means all the other cards actually matter more if that's what the whole meta is doing. So it's a lot of ifs uh, because we right now only literally we right now only know thirty five cards that's going to be in the next meta. 
We don't know which rotations are in. We don't know which core cards are staying or going. So we only know these 35 cards. So it's really hard to meta predict at this point, but some of these cards are, are clearly problematic. Uh, we had the same feeling for the previous uh, major set for Alteric, just because it was a ridiculous power creep at the time. This one, I feel like so far from what we've seen, it's not so much uh, even larger power creep. It's really just what we thought would happen. They're going to match Alteric, just like they've always matched the winter set in the spring. This is the new power level. If the winter set increases power levels, the spring set has always matched it with one exception. It was whenever Abyssal Enforcer was released, the sets afterwards actually uh, were, were less ridiculous. Um, I'm either getting this backwards or forwards. Abyssal was either the one that broke the series of underpowered sets or it was the one that preceded the series of underpowered sets. But that happened once in Hearthstone history. In every other instance, the spring set and the whole year afterwards matched the power level of the winter set from the year before. Um, so this is just what we expect. And um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that they put all the powerful sets in because this last meta was was not fun. This is like a prime example of what happens when you try to do a truly wild uh, arena with no advanced offering rate meddling. Uh, and you just have terrible cards that you have to pick next to really insanely good cards. Organ Greaser. Organ Greaser is a great example. Mm -hmm. um, just perfect fuel for <laughs> even the troll bat riders, which right now are just like, okay, cool. That, that's a fine card. We're not even talking about the night captains. Like just the troll bat riders. They, they die to those that man, th that, those are sad situations. I have lost to so many troll bat riders. So many, good, not, not because but, I have yeah, Oregon greaser, fine. just because like they're, they're surprisingly good in this meta. They're good. Yeah. They, they they do work. They do a ton of work, uh, so that's fine. No, so right, no shame working greaser to completely getting <laughs> dominated by that card, but still a little bit of shame. We have a lot to go, guys. Mm. A lot of cards. We still have the core reveal. No need to panic right now because there's nothing to panic about. Yeah. If you guys are already worried and complaining right now, you're hopeless. I don't know what to say. Uh, there's absolutely nothing there i have stated the things that i am a little bit worried about and i'm hoping that these are things that we can keep an eye on that will be resolved uh by us knowing more cards knowing what the core set is knowing what the rotation is but yes we just wait and if you don't want to play the current arena that's fine it's not your job you look at all these streamers and for some of them, that is their job. They have to play it. You don't. Just go do something else for now. Go And then go watch the streamers and laugh at their faces, right? That's what you can do. Go go, go find something else for now. Go play, I don't know, like uh, Sun is playing Slay the Spire right now. I think some other people are playing Elden Ring. Go go do that for a while, okay? I've, uh, cool down. I uh, started playing Triangle Strategy on the Switch. The story is pretty good. The, the the mechanics themselves and the strategy part of it is a little underwhelming, but I'm not that deep into it. Uh, so maybe it gets significantly more strategic and complex, but otherwise the story is pretty good. Yep. Um, okay. All right. Yeah, uh, that's it for, for this episode. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the Patreons, patreon.com slash grinning goat. Thank you guys so much for all of your support. And we will continue talking about uh, Voyage to the Sunken City from here on out. Because there's not much to talk about in the current meta. It's not changing. We're going to play Priest after this uh, for the Arena Coop. Um, and this is if you just listen to Life Force, you don't watch the Arena Coop, uh, you should go watch the previous Arena Coop that we just wrapped up. Uh, it was totally ridiculous. And uh, I think it's uh, it was a good time. Um, so check that out. Um, it's the one prior to this one. We were Paladin, I think, right? Yeah, we were Paladin. Uh, this one, we're going to be Priest. I have not... Obviously, we haven't done it yet, but I have played exactly one Priest in this meta. And just that one run where I met against nothing particularly weird, I just wanted to quit this whole entire game. 
I, I feel like Warrior in this meta is still so much more fun to play than Priest, even though Warrior has a much lower win rate. Priest is just painful. Not just terrible, but also painful. But we're going to do it because we don't get a choice for the most part. Uh, and definitely not this part because we just haven't played Priest in a long time. So, all right. All right. Anyway, enough rambling. See you guys next week. Have a good night. And uh, until next time, this is Optico. This is Murps. Bye.